So that is what we attempt to do here, is get you to understand what the journey was. Brought in by a ship, and after having had your family broken up in West Africa, look what happened on the docks in Virginia. You see that? You can't read a narrative without it happening, without people. Uh, if we understand that, then we understand how precious the, these celebrations you're having. If you're a Polk, if you're an Evans, you're special because you survived this, this intrusion on your life. Why would you throw that away by disrespecting your father, your mother, your grandparents, or the tradition that says you go to church and you go to school and you make something of yourself? And that anything other than that causes you then to become a number again. Every morning at 5.30 here in Cincinnati, I've seen the same thing in Fulton County in Atlanta. I've seen it in Baltimore. I've seen it in New York City at the tombs. At 5.30 in the morning, the brothers come out of the wagons in chains. Mm. Mm. Rassam Roland Kirk would call it volunteer slavery. <laughs> and I think so much of that happens because we don't understand what the cost of freedom has been, what the journey has been, where somebody selectively decided that if I take the baby away from you, I can get more for you. So what we did, so you would understand the meaning of the building that's behind you, was talk about the journey. We were taken by train, we walked, we were taken by boat, and we were moved west and south. And we cleared the land as we went, and as they pushed the native people off the land. So we're talking about a couple of acts of overt violence. The forced removal of the native people, we don't talk much about that. But there was somebody there before we got there. <laughs> and then after they brought us in, we chopped down the trees, burned the stumps, cleared the land, and began the process that resulted in the bounty that created, that underwrote the Industrial Revolution. And, and let me explain this. Let me take just a little time and then we'll move on. This product closed all the cotton mills in Bristol and Manchester, England, and they moved to New England. So all the white families in New England who say, well, my family didn't have a thing to do. I'm Scotch-Irish. We didn't have a thing to do with slavery. All right? But you were making socks and shirts and pads out of free cotton produced with black hands. Do you see where I'm coming from? And all of this new machinery, all of these new manufacturing techniques were as a result of the work being done that gave us capital reserves, surpluses, that allowed us to surpass the rest of the world because we could produce products cheaper because we were using free labor. Guess who provided the free labor? When we look at Monticello, I'm on the board of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. When you go to Monticello, nobody will tell you that the woodwork, that the wood, that the finials, in other words, those fancy posts at the bottom of the stairs were carved by black hands. Nobody will tell you, but Thomas Jefferson tells you on page 17 of his notes from Virginia that the nails for Monticello were made by seven and eight year old black children. And that he sold the surplus to President James Mason. Madison, I'm sorry. What's the point? If we can do all of that enslaved, why is it now that young black men see work as a contagious disease? <laughs> and why is it we don't want to talk about it? Why is it we won't do honor to the memory of our ancestors? The young men who did the stonework outside, as I told you earlier, were paid by their father $32 an hour. He's the great-great-grandson of an enslaved stonemason, and all five of the hard sons were for Papa. But you can't work for Papa if Mama lets you talk back. 
You can't work for Papa or run Papa's co company if you don't take the calculus and the trigonometry that the youngest Hodge is taking this moment.